Good evening, everybody. Does, can everyone hear me a-okay? Good, 100%. It is my absolute honor and privilege to be your host for this spectacular evening. And thank you so much to Theodora as well for introducing myself, Lauren, um, who is an educational psychologist at the Center for Psychological Services and Career Development. And one of the areas which I am particularly passionate about over there is career development. Hence, this being right up my alley, and hence I'm being quite excited in terms of tonight and the information that's going to be presented to us as well. Now, I want to try and do justice to introducing Lori to you. And I may not be able to do the task, but I'm going to do it my very best and I'm going to own my confident voice and I'm going to own my space as well. Lori Muller and Nadia Bilchik in her absence as well, put together their commendable and impressive years of professional experience to put together a practical guide for women in the workplace entitled Own Your Own Space, The Toolkit for Working Women. And from this point, I think what I wanted to say is thank you to all of you for also being here and for owning your time and for availing yourself to hear what it is that is happening here and to hear the remarkable things that Laurie and Nadia have to share as well. Within career development, and I won't be long, I promise, we have a look at three very distinct kind of questions. The first being, who am I? Now, a lot of you may have been asked that question or a lot of you may have not been asked that question before. Who am I? Where are you going? And how do you get there? And very often with the own students that walk into my office as well, into my office space, the who am I question is very often missing and is very often lacking. Who am I? Seems an easy question, but not for all. And you may be one of those individuals here tonight in that kind of space who the who am I question may be a little bit tough to answer as well. And I think what it is that grabbed me about Own Your Space and the way that Nadia and Lori also communicates the Own Your Space is the vast array of manners in which they capture the who am I question. Who are you in terms of your interpersonal space? Who are you in terms of your headspace? What is going on in your mind? And what are the different kinds of things that you are currently thinking about? Where are you going? And what are the, all the tool sets, all the cornerstones of the things that you were dealing with in your life at the moment? And I think in terms of owning your time and owning your confident voice, that's something I really wanted to focus on because in practice as well, there have been many, and I'm not only speaking about females, but many males as well, who have not owned their self-confidence and who have not owned who they are. And this is exactly what Laurie and Nadia have done in this magnificent book as well. And not only is this book for our young graduates or postgraduates or for our alumni who are established or who may be thinking about a possible career transition. But this book is also for those of you who in your quiet moments may have asked questions such as, am I good enough? Will I make it? What if I fail? Or do I have what it takes? And I would like to invite you to own your time and to really immerse yourself in the, message, in the message that Lori brings with her tonight as well to this platform. So without saying anything further, please give Lori a very warm round of applause. Good evening, everyone. Lauren, thank you. Is this too loud? Lauren, thank you for that wonderful introduction to... UJ to Theodora to the Library Forum, thank you for having me. I am a UJ alumni, so it's really special to be back here tonight. 
And although it's called Toolkit for the Working Woman, gents, I'm so happy that you're sitting in the room because what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is universal. It's not just aimed at women. And really the essence of the book is about how do you become that best version of yourself. And what I'm going to share with you this evening is exactly that message. And what Lauren touched on is the who am I and the steps to help you get there. So I want you to take a minute and think about the brands or the branded products you've used since you woke up this morning. So think about it. It can be anything from the toothpaste you used to the kind of car you got into to a brand of clothing, to a, to a cellular device. Think about the brands you've used, and I want you to turn to the person next to you and just share two. This is going to be interactive. So I'm talking to you, but you're going to chat to me as well tonight. So just think about it. Two brands that you've used today, turn to the person next to you, share one. Okay, what a shout out. What are some of the things that I'm hearing? Anybody? Colgate? Aqueous cream? Anybody else? One more. Revlon. Okay. So, Apple. So now, when I hold up this device that everybody knows what this is, what words, images, experiences come to mind when I say Apple? What comes to mind? Expensive. Somebody else? Classy. We could say Steve Jobs. So really, what is a brand? It's a promise. It commands higher value. It creates emotional bonds. What do I mean by an emotional bond? Hands up, chiefs or pirates? That's an emotional bond. You love them, you don't know them, but you love them. It's in demand and there's a competitive advantage. And a successful branding program, it creates in the mind of the consumer, there is no product on the market like yours. So let's think about people that have branded themselves. Can you give me some examples of people that are brands? Some examples. David Beckham, Borna, Mateva, Tom Ford. So now, these are some of the ones that I selected. So again, if we say Oprah, what comes to mind when I say Oprah? What words, images, experiences come to mind? Pardon? Harper Studios. Everybody always says, look under your chair. <laughs> but we would say, she's a giver, she's warm, she's generous. So these are people that are brands. When I say their name, it automatically generates images, words, experiences. So Jeff Bezos, who's the founder of Amazon, he said, a brand for a product is like a reputation for a person. So think about it. What's your reputation? Because in the same way, a brand creates words, images, experiences in the minds of its audience, so do you. And that's what I want to share with you tonight, is to think what words images experience do you want people to think of you to associate with you when they think of you so in other words what do you have to do to become a brand and now more than ever it is so critical for you guys because coming after you've finished your studies and after you coming into the workforce <laughs> so when you're coming into the workforce what's going to differentiate you what's going to make you stand out your personal brand so now, your brand, it's built on what other people are saying about you, not what you say about yourself. And you have to position your brand, or your brand will be positioned by others. So from the second you walk through these doors in the morning, the second you're going to work, walk through those walk, workplace doors, people are going to start forming an impression of you. And so can I have two hands up of two people who know each other well? Who knows, do you guys know each other well? Lauren, and so can I ask you to stand up for a second? Sorry, I don't know your name. I met Lauren earlier. Ayanda, can you give me some words? If you had to describe Lauren, what would you say? Wonderful. Thank you. So she said energetic, smart, fun. You can sit down, ladies. Thank you. So what's the point? 
people are already ascribing a vocabulary to you and people are already ascribing words to you, whether you are consciously involved in the process or not. So now let's get you on the process, embark on the process of getting you to creating your personal brand. Because what you've got to come to terms with now is when someone thinks of you, what do you want them to associate with you? What do you want to be known for? So I'm going to ask you to take a minute and whether you've got a pen or paper here or even if you take out your phones and, and just put it in your notes, write down three things. Should be four, but we've got time constraints. So write down three things that you want to be known for. If you can do that for me quickly and then we'll do the next part of the exercise. So when someone thinks of you, what do you want to come into their mind? Okay, so the next part of the exercise is you're going to turn to the person next to you and you're going to share one, but there's a caveat to this. You're going to share one of those words that you want to be known for, but you have to share what activity are you doing to reinforce it. So for example, for me, in my personal brand, as a speaker, as a trainer, being able to be responsive is really important to my personal brand. I have my ringly and my ringly sync to my phone and I know every time a message comes in and it allows me the opportunity, I might be busy, but I can quickly send off a message and say, I can't chat to you now, but I'll respond to you later. I saw your email. I'll come back to you as soon as I have time. And the fact that I do that is important to my clients and part of my brand. So think about, so share now quickly with the person next to you one of those things, but what are you doing to reinforce it? Off you go. Okay, has everybody had a turn? Has everybody spoken? The point of that exercise, we can't walk around with a t-shirt with three adjectives going ambitious, go get a team player. And we don't walk around with a Woolies label meaning best quality. Our brand is experiential and it's experienced moment by moment, second by second, interaction by interaction by the people you influence and who you want to be influenced by. So I want you to start becoming self-aware of your behavior because everything you do and say communicates the value and the character of your brand. And that's when a disconnect happens because you go, well, I really want to be seen as a team player. I really want them to know I'm, I'm ambitious. But sometimes there's a disconnect between what we want to be known as and what we're doing. So I want you to keep that in mind, that everything you do and say communicates. So if we're talking about communicating our brand, I want you to start remembering that every day is an opportunity to reframe other people's perceptions of you. And every day is an opportunity to persuade, to inspire, to motivate those around you. And often we say, don't judge a book by its cover, but we naturally do. And we land up creating perceptions. And although we're not doing it on a conscious level, it really has an impact on our perceptions. So when I walked in here this evening, you had already formed an impression of me in probably 30 seconds by the way I walked in, by the way I stood up, by what I was wearing, and I hadn't said good evening yet. And that's the reality. So if we're thinking about 
communicating our brand, I want you to have this almost third eye watching you all the time. And everything you do has to have the basis of, is this going to positively impact my brand? So think about, because when I say decide what you want to be known for, it's not just to have four adjectives. That has to form the basis of every decision you make. And if we're talking around communicating your brand, it's verbal, right? But Professor Maharabian, he was from UCLA, he said, when you communicate, 7% of, of the words you use, that's how a message is taken in. Only 7% are the words. 38% is your tone of voice, and 55% is your body language. So if you think about how much you're not saying, so we say, so if I said to you, what's more important, what you say or how you say it? What do you think is more important? How you say it. Because if I came up to you and I said, Lauren, we need to talk. Or if I came up to you and I said, Lauren, can we have a talk? Very different. The one you petrified and the one you excited to come and have a chat to me. So always remember, and I put this up to say that in terms of when you're communicating, there's two elements. It's the what and the how. And I put up the phone there to make you remember so that you can have this beautiful, super sexy iPhone 6. If it's not charged, it's not going to have a connection. And it's the same with your relationships. It's great to have the content, and it's important to have the content, but bear in mind the way that it's delivered. And I'm going to ask Bongani just to press play because I want to show you a video. And the point of this is to reinforce it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Sorry, just trying to get that off. Scene. I wrote the scene, but in different words. Thanks, love. Do you know how many times I've had to see that video and not cry? many embarrassing moments in presentations but that's the point so just remember it's not always what but it's the how informing your personal brand so we say your brand's experiential people experience you moment by moment how so if you can see on the outside of the graph it's around your honor your integrity that forms part of your brand your skills your knowledge that's why you hear consistency central to that your attitude, self-awareness, and accountability. What does that mean? Your accountability is you are responsible for your personal brand. You are responsible for your behavior, and you can never blame anybody else for how you act. Self-awareness, it's the cornerstone of everything that we teach that's in the book. Once you start becoming self-aware of how you are, how you operate, that starts the building blocks for your personal brand. Again, is that what do I want to be known for? And the last one that's so important is attitude because you can teach skills and you'll leave here with amazing skills, but you can't teach attitude. And your attitude is the way you view the world. And you all had a choice. You could come here this evening with an attitude of self-defeat 
or you could come here with one of self-motivation. And especially on campus, the groups that you work with, this is a people environment. You're going into the workforce, it's a people-orientated space. People want to do business with people they like to be around. And you don't want to be known to be great at what you do, but the image is that, oh, they've got a terrible attitude. And I'm sure we all know people like that. They're negative and they're not pleasant to be around. And that forms part of their personal brand. And I actually want to read you a quote that came from one of the interviewees from the book. And it's from, her name's Giselle Wertheim Ems, and she's the chief executive officer for Longevity and LMAG. And we were having a discussion around what's important to you when you interview people for the magazine and for your industry. And she said, I look for an inquiring, curious mind and tenacity, a person with problem solving skills and a can do attitude, who must be able to pick him or herself up and move ahead no matter what the challenge, solutions driven a person who will take responsibility for solving problems and not wait for others to fix them. Be careful about the temptation for job hopping for money only. If you do not love what you do, it's not sustainable. And loyalty, consistency, and integrity is always rewarded in the long run. So always remember, attitude. And then what we'll touch on quickly here is, how do you put across your personal brand? It's your physical presence, which we'll touch on. How do you come across physically? your virtual presence, how do you send an email, how do you make a phone call, your interpersonal presence, how do you deal with conflict, and lastly, your social presence, do you have networks? And just remember, everything you do and say communicates, because it takes a lifetime to build a reputation, and it takes one silly mistake to ruin it. So, and also having said that, we do make mistakes, and that's part of human nature, but it's also how you deal with it that'll save your personal brand. So another way to look at a personal brand is what we call the pie, performance, image, and exposure. So performance is how well you do your tasks. How do you do on your exams? How well do you do in your tests? When you get into the work workforce, how do you do your job? But your image is how do people see you? Are you known as creative, a team player? Are you known as ambitious? And exposure is who knows about you. How are you going to start creating those networks and how are you going to start creating visibility for yourself? So in other words, how do you want to show up in other people's minds? Because we've said when you think of Apple, Oprah, we know words, images, experience come into their minds. How do you want to show up in other people's minds? So starting with dress, because the way you put yourself across physically is the way you dress, the way you connect with others, and the way you hold yourself. So you may as well put forward the best possible version of you. So if we start with dress, it's not about, I have to go buy this expensive wardrobe. It's not about spending money. It's about looking presentable. It's about, are your clothes clean? Did you wash your hair? Do you look like you haven't shaven in three weeks? Is your skin looked after? Is it clean? It's the way that you come across. Because it's not, and when you get into that working world, it's also about consistency, even here. You can't arrive for an interview or snares and then the next day, you know, the next week you get your job and then arrive someone completely different. They're going, what happened to that person? Because image can be a tool. So remember, it's also around, if you think of a pilot, and when you get on a plane, you're basically putting your life in the hands of that pilot. But the way he comes across, he's groomed, the uniform, he's well presented. You're going, I can trust this guy. But if he arrived in a tracksuit with holes in it, unshaven, kind of like the guy on the slide, you're going, can he, I don't trust this guy, he's not going to fly my plane and you'll find a different airline. So it's not only, that's why I say, don't think image is clothing equals expensive. It's giving someone the, 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 the knowledge that, wow, this person looks after themselves, I can trust them. Because if you don't bother to look after yourself, why should they? And again, if you get into the working world and even here on campus, it's about that superior, your boss, your manager going, wow, this person looks like they're ready for leadership. This is someone who, when you, they think of you, they can see you in a, in a greater position. So it's always signaling to them you are capable of greater things. So now let's look, what is dress? Is it verbal or nonverbal? It's nonverbal. And when it comes to image, Dress is one aspect, 
but we're talking about image when we look at the pie. So if we look at some of the non-verbal things, firstly, it's around, ah, oh, not yet, sorry. Oh, can we do Bogani? Can we quickly do this video? This is to one to end off around closing off the segment on dress. <laughs> authentic be authentic okay firstly don't dress like that and in, in the corporate world you'll get nowhere depending what you want to do but guys it's about being authentic be true to who you are and when you get into the working world depending on what field you want to get into where you want to be there will be a dress code you'll need to adhere to depending on where you want to be so the rule of thumb is to say be appropriate to the environment but always be authentic to yourself because if you're not authentic, that's what comes across. And you can find unique ways. I've got a client. She's a really, really senior marketing director. Her thing is her glasses. So she has these really funky glasses that she wears and that's what she's known for. So she'll arrive dressed to the nines. She'll look amazing when she's got a board presentation, but she's kept that thing that's hers. So just remember authenticity. So we've said in terms of the verbal part, just some things, and what we talk about in the book is saying we share a series of BLOs. Any guesses what a BLO is? A blinding light of the obvious. Because sometimes we share things that we know, but we don't always put it into practice every day. So I'm going to share some of those BLOs when it comes to the verbal. And the one thing is manners. Never forget the simple thing of saying a please and a thank you, of remembering people's titles that they've worked hard to earn, a doctor, and also never interrupting someone when they're speaking. If you're speaking and someone keeps cutting you off, it's going to start sabotaging your brand. It's so all of these things. That's why I keep being aware of what I'm saying. The other thing is around, so in terms of, is mind what you're shutting down? Don't be that person that is always going, no, it can't be done. It's impossible. We'll never manage it. Can't happen. Don't become that person. That's what you're going to be known for. Be the problem solver, find the solution, find the way that you can get it done. And people want to be with you. People will want to rally around you, be on your team. Stay away from gossip, whether it's celebrity, political, office gossip. Socrates said, great minds discuss ideas, wise minds discuss events, and weak minds discuss people. It will never serve you. Words you can do without. Start becoming aware of fillers. What are fillers? Um, um, the likes, like, you know? So when you start to become aware of someone that does it and you have a two-minute conversation and you've counted 30 likes, it starts to detract from your brand because it makes you seem a bit indecisive. Things like slang, things like swearing, keep it for your friends. It's not, if you've got general WhatsApp groups, when you get into the working world, it's not accepted. So stay away from that. And also be a giver. If someone does something great, if you do a project and someone did a really good job, thank them. You know, speak to your lecturers, let them know, share the gratitude because people appreciate that and it make, puts you in a better light. So if we look at the other 55% that comes from your nonverbal, and there's a great quote that says, some believe 80% of your message is communicated nonverbally. And after you deliver a message, people remember, it's not what you say but it's the way that you make them feel. So going to some of the nonverbals, first thing is eye contact. Because the sooner you make eye contact with someone, it signals to them that you're giving them your full attention, that you want to focus, that you are present, that you're listening to what they say. Because it can be quite disconcerting when you're talking to someone and they're kind of looking over the room looking for someone more important to talk to. It doesn't make you feel nice. Things like greeting. If you're walking into a a lecture hall, if you're coming to sit in the library, maybe you don't know that person, but just greet them. You cross the same corridors every day. You don't have to have a conversation, but just by having that acknowledgement, that pushes up your personal brand. Also, when you're getting to the workplace, your security guards, the people on campus, 
just to acknowledge them and greet them. Participate, well, before participation is preparation. So before a lecture, especially when you get into your first interviews, prepare. There's amazing tools. Use LinkedIn. Go online, research the person that you're going to meet, research the company, read about them. A, you know what they look like. And B, you can see what are they interested in. Maybe they've written some great posts. So when you do sit down with them, you can say, wow, I see you've tweeted around this, or maybe you'd find this topic quite interesting, or this book would be of interest to you. So it's not being inauthentic, but you're showing that you sat down to prepare, that you're ready for this interview. And that already will elevate your personal brand because you're coming from a place where you're pretty much leaving with a similar skill set. Obviously, everyone's getting a degree. It's an amazing achievement. But if you're sitting in that room in that interview, you've got to show them how do I kick it up a notch. Show that you've prepared and that already elevates you. And then participate. Because it's all well to do all this wonderful research that's sitting in your back pocket. But if you don't put your hands up, be that in the lecture hall, be it in an interview, because you have every right to interview as well, to ask questions. Show that you've thought about something. Ask questions. Ask where, you know, what's their growth strategy? Where do they see you in five years? Ask some questions back, but participate. No one will ever know your value unless you put your hand up. And this comes from women I've trained who've been in business for many years, that they walk in, they try to slip to the side of the boardroom and just want to sit there for the whole time, not put up their hand. Because they're too scared that what they're going to say is not good enough. But you become, we all know no-name brands. If you sit in the corner, you will become that no-name brand. And the image out of the pie, when people think of you, is, oh, they're quiet, they never say anything. Oh, she, just, she never says a word, he never says a word. You don't want to become that person, so put your hand up, have a comment, have an opinion, because people respect you for that. So now, moving on from, from our, ver our verbal and nonverbal is around your interpersonal presence. And what is that? It's the way you deal with conflict. Because you could be the most articulate, magnificently dressed person. But your inability to deal with people will sabotage your brand. Someone said to me, they've got an employee who's amazing, he is so brilliant, but must not be allowed to work with people. And I'm sure we know somebody like that who are so brilliant, but they're just not great with people. And we've got to learn to deal with that because that is also what's going to elevate your personal brand. And so now we know what we want to be known for. We've written those down and we say, let it help us make decisions but it makes decisions in a conflict situation. So next time you find yourself in a conflict, in a difficult conversation with someone, say to yourself, react to the outcome and not to the event. And I'll share a story that demonstrates this. A few weeks ago, I was called into an NGO to brainstorm some ideas how we could raise money for their fund. And it was a rainy day. There was lots of roadworks happening in town. I got lost. I found myself, got there. And when I walked inside, the client that I was meeting was on her way out. And let's call her Jill. I said, Jill, aren't we meeting now? And she said, oh, no, I've got the worst flu. I'm just going to go to the pharmacy and go home. So I said, oh, and, and what about our colleague? Because we were meeting another lady. And she said, no, 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 she left 20 minutes ago. There was an emergency. She was called out. And in those, what felt like 10 minutes was 10 seconds. I just took a deep breath and I said, what do you want to be known for? Because my initial gut, my initial reaction was extreme frustration. I'm an A-type, I plan things, I made sure that I moved things around, that I could be there. And my initial reaction was frustration, but I overrode it because I understood reacting to the outcome meant making sure my personal brand came first. And I said to her, I'm so sorry you're feeling ill. And I walked her to her car. I said, I really hope you feel better. And I hope the emergency was sorted out. And she was so grateful for the way that I reacted. Because I left with my brand intact. Had I reacted to the event, what was the event? She was late. Well, she, didn't, she wasn't late. She didn't cancel the meeting. She left the meeting and didn't bother to let me know. I could have chosen to go, you're so rude. You're calling me in to help you. Now you're not even doing the meeting. How would you expect me to work with you again? I could have chosen that reaction, but who would that have served? Nobody. And it would have damaged my brand, no one else's. She would have said, oh, that Laurie, she's terrible to work with. 
So what I say is always, and it's hard in that situation because our gut feel is to react, we get defensive, we get cross. So we say press the mental pause button and just react to the event, not the outcome. And when dealing with conflict, we say know thyself, seek first to understand and assume positive intent. So as I said, and also understand what are your triggers. So you guys are going through a difficult part with studying, with lectures, exams get stressful. So just start to take a little internal audit and go, right, how am I when I get stressed? And just start to realize that maybe you get snappy. Maybe you react in a way that you don't normally. If we sleep deprived, it, it makes us the worst version of ourselves. So just start to become aware of that and react to the outcome. As I said, be aware of your internal monitoring system. So now we're talking about our virtual presence because we say everything we do and say communicates, but we automatically assume it's everything we do and say in person. And what we forget about is that everything in the virtual space, anything we do, impacts our brand. So I'm assuming everybody's got email in the room, yes? And anybody can email us all the time. We have three decisions when we get an email. We can open it immediately, we can delete it, or we'll save it for later. What makes us decide that? That name that comes into your inbox is a brand, just as much as the website or the company that it's coming from. And you want to make sure when your name hits that someone else's inbox, they go, it's Lauren, I better open it straight away. It's going to be important. So bear in mind, everything we do virtually communicates our brand as well. So I'm going to run through these quite quickly because these are things we take for granted, which really will impact your personal brand. Correct contact details and spelling. Often the person's name is in the email address. I got an email the other day starting with Dear Corey. I thought, well, if you can't bother to spell my name right, I'm not really interested in the rest of your email. And that's what goes through people's minds. Your subject line, is it strong? Is it relevant? Introduce yourself. Sometimes we take for granted that they must know who I am. So introduce yourself. Let them know the context. Your tone. And this is a huge thing, touching on interpersonal. Never, ever, ever email or send a WhatsApp or a text in anger. Because often we send it, we might have got something that throws our guard a bit, and automatically we want to respond straight away and we're angry and we're upset. You can never take it back. So rather press the pause button, close your laptop, whatever you're working on. Take a day, breathe, get calm, and then respond. Things, your content, is it clear? Don't write a thesis for your email. Thesis is for your lecturers, not for emails. If someone sees a very long email, their automatic gut reaction is they want to delete it or they'll move on. Sign it off appropriately. So these aren't, when you get into the working world, it's not your buddy. So you can't say, so sign it off. Your sincerely, best regards. Have a, a formal way of closing it. Read it again. Sometimes we write in a hurry or we miss you know, the little this or er, uh, and then the sentence doesn't read well. So read through something again. And lastly, well, this, it's also about overstepping time boundaries. So just think if you are mailing someone very late at night or over a weekend, always just qualify it and say, I'm just catching up on my mails. Look forward to chatting on Monday so that people don't think that you're trying to encroach on their weekend time or their after hours time. So now this is your new business card because by the time you get into the working world, when you have your first interview, they've already checked you out. They'll go into, so does anyone have a LinkedIn profile yet? Okay, please make that the first thing you do. And even for now, if you're not in the working world, have a LinkedIn profile. When you do get there and you've got a job, have, and we'll go through some of it, but have a detailed summary detail of what you do and it's not just about having a cv online it's showing your skills what you're great at and remember that they've gone to check you out they've gone to facebook they've gone to twitter so they really have a pretty good idea about who you are when you get there just some things around profile pictures this is more from a linkedin point of view but also because linkedin is the business profile so facebook Twitter, have what pictures you want, but also remember, if you want a general WhatsApp group or even in the office, they form WhatsApp groups. Make sure it's not a Saturday night selfie doing something silly. Make sure it's something quite presentable. So why I say the do's is, I'll start with the lady on the top left. She's an image consultant and she looks lovely, she's presentable and you'll go, oh, I'd love to do business with her. 
The one on the side runs her own events company, which is a great way of showing what she does, but also who she is. And the one at the bottom, gents, is just a great picture. You can use your phones, stand against a plain background. It's a nice picture. The picture's meant to say, I like you, I trust you, I want to do business with you. Why well, I say the don't, that girl, she's beautiful, but she's also an analyst. And if I was doing business, if I was a client and looking at it, you, you're great, but it kind of doesn't match what you do and who you're saying that you are. The guy on the side, I, I don't think it's the best picture, having his beer and his cigar on a Sunday somewhere. That's not a business picture. And always put a photograph. I always say I don't really trust someone who doesn't have a profile picture. I say, what are you hiding? But just remember in terms of social media, to get an awareness that we're talking about your personal brand now, but remember, you also represent UJ, and you also will represent your future employer's company. And what you say will have a huge impact. So what we write about in the book is Emma Sadler, she's a social media expert, law expert. And she spoke about the billboard test. Now, every single one of us have got one of these billboards. So we put it corner, William Nickel and Santon Drive. It's pretty central. It's got your picture. It's got the UJ logo. And it's got whatever you are going to post. And it's lit 24 by 7. Are you still going to post it? Because that's what you need to think about when you're posting on social media. I did a talk for a group of grads the other day. And we were talking about Facebook. And he was devastated. He thought I was making him break up with his best friend. And I said, no, you can post, but there's a consequence. So if you post something that's a little bit dodgy, if you post something that's controversial, it's your choice, but it's your brand. And understand that what you put out there will impact your personal brand. So just be aware of the accountability of it. And lastly, how are we for time? Okay. And then lastly, moving into your social presence your networks. So now we've decided, we know what we want to be known for, and now we're acting congruently and consistently with that vision. How do you start to get yourself known, and how do you create networks? So I want to ask, has networking benefited anybody? So is anyone at UJ as a result of knowing someone? Has someone got something as a result of knowing a friend who knew a cousin who got them into somewhere? So I'll share my story. So Nadia and I, who's my co-author, we were introduced via family friends. And Nadia is based in Atlanta. And said, oh, you must see what Laurie's doing. She's got these women's programs. And they said to me, Nadia does this training. And they sent her DVD over to South Africa. And because her mom still lives in the country, we connected. And after many conversations, we collaborated. So just think about it in your life. Has networking benefited you? Because it's built really on three things. It's having a connection, a conversation, and a collaboration. And maybe think about where your strengths, where your weaknesses. Because often, sometimes we hold ourselves back in having a conversation. We're not sure how to. So always remember, everyone has a past, everyone has a present, and everyone has a future. So if you're stuck on how to connect with someone, have a conversation. Those are the, a great, thought start, a great uh, sentence starter. Because, guys, this is where your network starts. It's, it's not around who else is more important, who do I need to connect with. This is your network. Because when you leave here, someone could have the next equivalent of Facebook. Someone could have the next Microsoft idea. And they go, you know what? I worked with that amazing Bongani, and he was brilliant. I'm going to bring him into my business. So, guys, it starts here. So start having those conversations. Start finding out where you can help each other. And a really important skill that I want to touch on is about listening. Because when you listen, you give someone the opportunity to be heard. Because when we're not heard, we remain invisible. So I want us to practice this now quickly. I want you to turn to the person next to you and share with them what has been your greatest challenge this year so far. But for the listener, there's a caveat. You cannot interject with your own experience. And then you're going to swap. So quickly turn to the person next to you. You ladies can do three together. Share with them what's been your greatest challenge. And then I want you to swap. But remember, you can't interject with your own experience. Off you go. Thank you. 
what time I'm supposed to finish? Oh, cool. I'll finish now. I'll wrap now. That's perfect. I'll wrap up now. Well, I need five minutes to wrap up. This exercise takes a little bit of time. Okay, guys, swap over. So whoever was speaking, you can swap partners now and, and switch over. Okay, is everyone finished? We're a bit tight on time, so I'm sorry. I'm cutting the second half a bit short. Did anyone find that difficult? Because doesn't it make you wonder? We engage in a conversation, but we're so busy focusing on what we want to say next and our own thoughts that we don't always really listen to what the other person's saying. And on the flip side, did anyone sit next to someone they didn't really know well tonight, until tonight? Didn't they just become a three-dimensional person? They're not just someone I walk past and kind of nod. They're now this person that I know something about. So just think, in, in what, I gave us two minutes, we built a connection. So start, we have to start doing that more. And the other aspect is how do you create visibility for yourself? When you get into the working world, it's about starting to ask for more responsibility. Can I take this on? Can I help with this? The more you take on, the more you build trust and the more you make yourself indispensable. And it's also about finding a sponsor and a mentor. So a mentor is someone you can go to for advice and guidance. It's someone that will chat to you both from a work perspective, but a personal perspective as well. But a sponsor is someone who's going to open doors for you. So an example of that in this context, if, you, if Theodora was having a meeting with her colleagues and they were deciding on who's going to get a chance to be part of a really exciting project and she chose Lauren, Theodora is being a sponsor because she's getting her into a position. But from Lauren's perspective, she really has to deliver because it's like the mafia. Theodora is vouching for her. So if I vouch for you, you better perform. But it's about creating those relationships. And something that I want to share with you to keep with you is... When you are in that workforce or even before, find someone that you admire and if you pick up the phone or send them an email and you say, you've navigated corporate South Africa really well, or if it's journalism or whatever you're interested in, do you, what advice or guidance do you have for me? Any time would be really appreciated. Rather going, can't you get me a job? Can't you introduce me to someone? Because if you do that, they're gonna, their, their back's going to be up because you're not honoring them. And the way in terms of networking is you always have to go, how can I be a go-giver? What can you give? And if you have that conversation and you ask them for their time, you can give gratitude. You can say thank you. You can honor them. And also things if you want to start getting yourself out there, even if it's a simple blog that you run, write articles, newsletters. There's such amazing media and technology that you can start to do it. So to close off, you are all in an incredible space right now. So start being aware of your personal brands because a career is not the linear ladder it used to once be. It's a maze. And it's a maze that will take you sideways, backwards when it has to, upwards, down, forwards. But it's also an opportunity. Your career is a place to build many different skills, create different networks, learn from different projects. But it's also the opportunity to constantly reinvent your personal brand. The person I am today is not who I was five years ago. And that's an exciting thing in itself. So I want to play one last video before I close off. Come the 
Just stay back. I'm the lyrical gangster. Big up the crew in the area. Still on the right band. No, no, we don't die. Yes, we multiply. Anyone press me, the fire is safe. I got you know we go. I know what both don't know. Let's get up and go. Here come the young people. I'm the lyrical young son. She got the movie in the area. Still I get like that. Here come the young people. I'm the lyrical young son. Excuse me, Mr. Officer. Why did I show you that video? When we were kids, we just played. We were present. We just had fun. We didn't worry what happened on the playground last week or who am I going to play on the swings with next week. We were present and we had fun and we had passion. So guys, what I want to say to you is love what you do. You're in a place now where you're building who you want to be. What do you want to be known for? And just make sure that you're authentic, that you're doing what you love. If you love what you do, you will always be a success. So what we've touched on is that your brand is a culmination of everything we do, everything we say. It's built up moment by moment, experience by experience, and interaction by interaction. So what I'm asking you to do today, this 26th of April, is think, what do I want to be known for? And then always act congruently and consistently with that. And I assure you, if you do, you will develop an exemplary brand and really be someone that owns their space. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Laurie. Um, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who's going to take a tremendous amount of skills away from what it is that you just shared with us as well. And I wanted to start off, um, I have only two questions, so you guys can have the rest as well. I'll share. And I wanted to start off and by commenting on one of the things that I see a lot in our kind of practice and the work that we do with, with our students, with your peers, um, and even with some of you as well who may have come to us too. And a lot of the time what happens is that a lot of ex or a lot of decisions, a lot of big decisions we have to make without any real experience. Um, and if I think about choosing a career, if I think about, I mean, buying a car, buying a house, getting married, I don't know because I haven't been and I don't have the experience of that as well. So you're walking into the world of work pretty blindly as well at the end of the day. And one of the biggest pieces of advice or, or the the I almost want to say the most valuable pieces of advice that have been coming from us is job shadow and go out there and see what the world of work really is like because there's no way that I can tell you about a commas or, a, or I almost want to say about um, an artistic kind of spectrum while I'm more in a psychological kind of world as well. And I wanted to ask you based on that, what kind of advice do you have for our students sitting here, maybe first years, maybe second years, maybe even postgraduates, moving into the world of work in terms of challenges, in terms of things that they may face on a professional kind of level, um, and what it is that they can expect. And I was wondering if you could also speak to us around your own experience as well. Okay, so I'm going to divide that into two questions. So the one, to answer your question around the prepared aspect, I'd say there's two things. The one is there are a lot of people out there that have been through what you want to do. Approach them and chat to them. So if you're between two careers or you're not sure, you're sort of on the fence between two, as I said, have a conversation with someone. Pick up the phone and say, you know what, I'm a student, I'm nearly finishing. Can I have half an hour of your time just to find out and ask you some questions? And I promise you, they won't say no. People do want to help you. 
So I think instead of sitting in this sort of fear, feel like, feeling like you're in the dark, having no idea where to go, there are people that have been there and done that, that w are willing to share their experience. So number one, I'd say reach out to them. Number two, I'd say sit down and be honest with yourself and go, where are my strengths and where are my passions? And find find the space or the career or the career path that's going to work for you. Because also what's quite exciting is people change career at least seven times, uh, change jobs during their entire professional life. So you can. I started in advertising. So if you want to know my journey, I did my honors in marketing here. And when I was doing my internship, I interned at TBWA and came the following year and I applied for a position while I was there in August, September, and they phoned me and they said, actually, we've got a, a position available. And I, I, I didn't know this is what I want to do, but it was in the field of what I'd studied and I started in advertising and my career then grew to branding, moving from being account management, then I moved into strategy and then I actually moved into cellular. Then I became an entrepreneur overnight and started a business in conjunction with my brother. And one day I woke up and said, I'm doing a job and, I and I'm not doing something that gives me meaning. And I'm not doing something that gives me a purpose. And that's where Beyond the Dress was born. And that started out as a series of events where I'd get different industry experts to come and chat to women. And that evolved and became customized corporate programs, which evolved into a book. So I'm saying if I join all the dots, starting out in advertising, what, in 2003 to where I am now, I would never have said that's going to be the progression. So I think just start in the place where you, where you know is a good fit and learn. Learn as much as you can. Because if I had to link back the dots and see, well, being in the ad agency and being in the position where I was in account management, I learned the whole business. I learned how business works. I learned how client dynamics works. I learned how dealing with people works. So no, that's not where I wanted to end up ultimately. But the skills and the knowledge that I learned from there, I took it on to the next job. And so let it become, you know, as I said, it's a skill set. And you learn with each project, with each job, you learn different skills. You build and you build and you build. So I think find the place where you know you want to start, jump in and, and sort of see where it, where it leads you. But when you're in there, Give it 100%. Ask for more work. Take on more responsibility. Be that person that everyone wants to be with. That's how you grow and develop. And also, in, once you've started in that field, meet regularly. See if you can find a mentor in there. Meet regularly with one of the execs. See if you can bounce ideas with them. Have coffee with them. And start to just build up a network and start to build up a rapport because people do want to help you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I I wanted to take away from what you were saying as well in terms of it being meaningful and it has to carry meaning otherwise it's almost like building your house your career house on sand and it won't necessarily carry you where it is we would like to go as well I think also realistically that we all start somewhere yeah and we're all going to have a first job and if I tell you what I earned for what how much work I did I did not earn well for my first job. And my advice would be don't make money your first deciding factor in your career. You get into that company you want to get into. You get into the space you want to get into. You start there. You work hard. And when you, when you start to build a name and you've got some great experience, that's when you can start to look around from a, a money perspective if you're not happy where you are. But your starting place should be, is that where I want to be? Is, because there's a... There is a stigma saying that, oh, well, Gen Y has come in and, you know, they want to be CEO the day they arrive and they want a salary increase two months later. Um, so it's also around, you know, you've got to do your time. And there's going to be parts of your job that you don't like because that's inevitable. But you almost have to do that. You have to put in the time and you have to put in that, those hours that you don't like to get to a point where you can start to choose what you want to take on. So it's not to say don't enjoy what you're doing, but don't be unrealistic that there will be elements that maybe you don't love, but see it as part of a, as a tool set that's going to keep growing you to where you want to be. And I think one of the grades that you had on your slide was Steve Jobs as well. And if I think of where he started in terms of Apple, he started out of a garage um, and he had one person 
and they started in a, in a kind of an entrepreneurship venture together. And the company, I cannot say how many times it was on the brink of failure, but it turned into an empire. And that speaks to what you're saying in terms of just start. start. I always say just start. You don't have to know what the end looks like. I didn't know publishing. I didn't know how to write a book. Nadia and I had collaborated for many years, doing events, doing training, and we were sitting down for coffee the one day, and she said, what can we do? And we started building this training, and we started developing this idea based on the experience we had from being in a training room. And so the concept of the book was born, and we, we were so excited about it, and Aileen, who's here from Pan McMillan, and I emailed her boss, and I said, We've got an idea. This is what I want to do. This is who we are. Can I come and see you? And they said, sure. Sounds great. Come and see us. And it started with an idea. But if, I, if we'd gone, oh, this is so silly. No one's going to buy into it. They're too busy. It's never going to work. I don't know how this is ever going to happen. And I would, have, I would have almost made myself fail before I started. But I'm quite ambitious and I, and I don't see no's in my, in my big picture. And also something... And a really great tool is, is visualization. So sit down or take out a book and just write down. There's a great tool and it says you write down three things, everything you want to do, everything you want to be, and everything you want to have. And it's for you, do it in the privacy of your room, take out a notebook and just write. Let your imagination go as wild as you want it to go. And when you finish and you read those things, don't tell yourself it's nonsense. Have that, you know, I'm sure you've heard of vision boards. But if you have a great idea, if you have a picture in your mind of what you want, that also informs the decisions. Because, well, if you want to land up in a particular industry, is this job going to be part of it to get you there? So also, you don't have to know how you'll get there, but have a pretty good idea of what you want, because no one can answer that for you. Thank you so much. Yeah, good answer. <laughs> Thank you. I think it also speaks to confidence um, and a possible lack thereof. And I think a lot of our students as well may struggle with the idea of self-concept and self-image and those kinds of things. And I wanted to know, again, what kind of advice you would give to someone um, who has not necessarily found that confident space and a confident voice who, who may find a task such as networking or a task such as just start quite difficult and, and quite challenging as well. So the thing about that and to, to make everybody feel better, so we did, Nadia and I actually ran a, we ran a workshop last year for quite a large company and it was for the top 30 females in the company. So these were all one level under Exco and we did feedback forms and the question was what is the one thing that you need in order to own it. And do you know what every single woman wrote? Confidence and self-belief. And these are women who have been in the industry for many years, who are very successful, who still deal with lack of confidence. So it's at every single level. And it's completely normal and it is completely natural. So what we speak about in the book is having, it's called a positive emotional memory disk. So the thing to understand is success is not something, it's, it's not something that's, you know, they say, so one of the interviews was from Pilati Gangwa from 702, and she says, you know, you're only as good as your last show, but that's not the real world. We are a culmination of all of our successes. And what we need to realize is to start creating this positive emotional disc that if you, imagine you put together a DVD reel that you were going to play in your head, and it had all the validating moments and all the proud moments in your life. And it could be from something great you did in high school. It could be from a, you know, an exam you did really well on. It could be from something you did in the community. Something that when you think of, it makes you smile inside and go, wow, I did that. And you have this reel ready and you play it in your mind and it's the reminder of, well, if I've done that, then you know, what, else, what can I start putting on in the reel going forward? So I think you've got to, what we're not great at is acknowledging the things we've done well. So I think as a starting point, acknowledge what you've done well, because all of you sitting in this room, it's an incredible achievement. It's really amazing. So, I mean, this should be on your reel, just being here and being part of an institution like this. And also understanding it's normal. 
but and and there's something we say that we call it having fear but it's false evidence appearing real and often what we're scared of and especially in terms of having that conversation it's a fear of the discomfort of the conversation it's not an actual fear of, it's it's the fear of what's going to happen you know and and i mean i'll share a story i did an event for unilever last week and i had this photographer who was booked about two weeks ago for, i mean two months ago and she phoned me two weeks ago and she said i've been having this conversation for a week in my head i phoned every person i know i've practiced this conversation 30 times with my husband she says would you mind at all if I get somebody else to cover the event? I've been offered the opportunity of a lifetime. She says, if you say no, I don't mind, and I promise you I'll do it, but I have to ask. And she didn't know that on the other side of the phone was another entrepreneur. Who knows? These opportunities come around so seldom. And I said to her, of course, it's no problem. I said, make sure that she's great, it's your name. She says, no, of course, she's amazing. And the person did a great job. And she got the opportunity to be at one of, it's probably like the wedding of the century. It was a huge thing for her being a photographer. She was part of this amazing event. But if she didn't have the confidence to pick up the phone and she didn't, and she pushed through that fear, she would have missed out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laurie. I, I, can I ask to do one thing quickly? Oh, for well, sure. Sorry, I actually forgot. There was an exercise that I forgot to do in the middle of the presentation as I stand here. Can I hand, have hands up of just two volunteers? Lady. Yes, lady in red. Come up. <laughs> can I ask two ladies? So lady in red. And there was, and I need one more lady. Sipakazi. So I'd like to give you each a copy of my book. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Thanks, ladies. You can sit down. <laughs> so that was the test. We've spoken about networking we've spoken about participation we've spoken about putting yourself out there yeah. well done ladies yeah. so now think about that going forward when someone says go for it put your hand up what's our gut feel <gasps> don't look at me don't look at me i don't want it to be me but if you put your hand up look what can happen so, just a reminder. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm sure that you guys are dying to ask some questions of your own as well. And we have some limited time available. And take this opportunity to put up your hand because you never know <laughs> what may come out or what pools of wisdom you may be given and what you might leave with in addition to what you're already leaving with at the moment. So let's open the floor. Questions? Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. 